Thank you all for joining us this morning. Before we get started, I'd like to thank our sponsors for today's event. Uh, our gold sponsors up on the screen, Jacobs, the MIT Alumni Association, and the MIT Investment Management Company, and our silver sponsors, the MIT Federal Credit Union, Suffolk Construction, and MIT Professional Education. In addition to covering the cost of this morning's event, your sponsorship will allow us to contribute to two important MIT Public Boston initiatives. The first is the MIT Public Boston Endowed Scholarship Fund, which provides MIT undergraduate student financial aid. The second is the Science and Engineering Program for Teachers, which is a one-week summer program where selected teachers are exposed to a heavy dose of the latest and greatest science and engineering research delivered by MIT researchers and faculty. This is a great program, so if you know of any teachers in your local communities who would benefit from such a program, please encourage them to apply. Uh, representatives from our sponsoring companies are sitting up here in front. Please join me in thanking them for this time. This morning's program will begin with welcome remarks from Whitney Espick, the uh, CEO of the MIT Alumni Association. Whitney will introduce our plenary speaker. Uh, the plenary session will be followed by a panel discussion, and we'll leave plenty of time at the end of that for a Q&A. The plan is to wrap up the program at about 10.15, uh, but we'll have uh, networking opportunities in the same foyer afterwards, so please stick around if you can. Whitney Espick is the Chief Executive Officer of the MIT Alumni Association, where she directs the strategic effort to engage MIT's 137,000 plus alumni with the Institute and with each other to ensure that the global MIT community continues to reach out into the world with the aim of making it better. Whitney assumed the role of Chief Executive Officer of the Alumni Association in August of 2017. Prior to that, she served as Executive Director of Communications, Events, and Donor Relations in MIT's Resource Development Office. There, she played a significant role in launching the public process, the public phase, of the MIT Campaign for a Better World, collaborating across MIT to, to share the campaign's message with alumni and friends from around the globe. Whitney holds a BA from Indiana University Bloomington and master's degrees from the University of Virginia, and the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. Please join me in welcoming Brittany Espick. Good morning. Thank you, Mike, for that warm welcome. It's great to see so many alumni and friends eager to learn more about MIT's development in Kendall Square. You can't avoid it. Those of you who came on the tee this morning, there it was. As I think you will agree, this is a historic time in the Institute's growth. With Kendall Square, MIT is creating a new front door to the rest of the world into our campus community, a great way into our, a gateway into our thriving innovation ecosystem. I'm delighted that the MIT Alumni Association is a sponsor of today's important discussion, and I'm glad to be back again with our club of Boston friends. I'd like to give the club and its leadership a round of applause for bringing today together. Thank you. morning about the many ways MIT is directing its energy, both financial and intellectual energy, toward increasing our capacity to make a positive difference. Today's conversation will focus on MIT's innovation strengths and the creation of a built environment that can supercharge that capacity and influence. It will also explore our sense of responsibility for how that influence is experienced by society, our awareness that the work of the future is changing, and the MIT community has a role to play in how that change happens. Our mission has, a, has long included the phrase to work wisely, creatively, and effectively for the betterment of humankind. I think you will hear that spirit from our speakers today. And I know I experienced that in my many interactions with you, the alumni and friends of MIT. Thank you for being here this morning, and thank you for all you do for MIT. And now I have the pleasure to welcome Israel Ruiz, the leader of our plenary session, MIT's executive vice president and treasurer. 
He's the Institute's Chief Financial Officer and is a trustee of the MIT Corporation and a member of its executive committee. He is the Chief Steward of MIT's financial assets, and most relevant to today, he is responsible for administering the Institute's $5 billion capital campaign through 2030. Israel is also responsible for financial and debt strategy development, the integrity of financial information, human resources, information systems, security and safety, compliance, government relations, international support, sustainability, and medical. He is very busy. <laughs> Prior to becoming executive vice president and treasurer in 2011, Israel held several roles of increasing responsibility at MIT, most recently serving as vice president of finance. He previously held management and engineering roles at Hewlett Packard and Nissan Automotive. And he holds a master's degree, perhaps most importantly, from the MIT Sloan School of Management, as well as a six-year degree in industrial and mechanical engineering from the Polytechnic University of Catalonia in his native Barcelona. After Israel's presentation, we will welcome to the stage MIT Vice President for Communications, Nate Jefferson, who will moderate this morning's panel discussion and Q&A. I'd like to thank both of these good colleagues for their leadership and support of MIT's Alumni Association and our broad community of alumni and friends, and all that it and all of you make possible in the world. Thank you to you both. And now, please welcome to the stage Israel Ruiz. I was reflecting on this picture. This is pre-approvals from Kendall. Now you can see the difference. <laughs> so congratulations and good morning um, to making it here. Um, just to maybe calibrate a little bit the audience. How many of you are MIT alumni or MIT affiliated? Great. Double well, congratulations to you. How many are not? Okay, congratulations to you. Too. <laughs> um, so, so today we have, um, I think, a tremendous pleasure. Um, I may be busy, I'm not denying it, but I think this is one of the most pleasurable things we get to do, just to talk about um, a project that really transforms um, MIT and has been transforming as a duration for decades of the transformation of MIT. And when the panelists and myself will try to pull uh, together the history of how we got here and then tell you a little bit about the assignment of what we're doing today that will transform the future. So I'm going to point out the mission of MIT and how that connects to the innovation ecosystem that today we're we'll refer uh, around MIT in Kendall Square, the evolution of Kendall Square all the way from the crossing of MIT from Boston to Cambridge, how the ecosystem here helps and it really has distinct advantages that we are taking really um, to heart at MIT and beyond, and then how do we continue to invest and promote the kind of the leadership position that we have around Kendall Square. So first of all is the division of MIT, which you're quite familiar with. It's not only about education and, and research, but it's really about solving these world's great problems and challenges. And we bring together many people, many stakeholders, to solve those challenges. And to solve those challenges requires not only the invention part, but the innovation and the translation and the commercialization that we see. That has been going on for decades at MIT, even for centuries at MIT. But what we're now seeing is a tremendous acceleration of that process. This is the first picture of, like, think about what happened. So 1916, MIT makes the crossing. 1917, it opens the buildings. Just as a reminder for all of you, um, they open the buildings with a cost overrun. I remind <laughs> my trustee. Um, it's recorded. It's in the president's report. Um, it cost $7 million to build the entire MIT Seven million. Um, that, those were quite the times, but at the time what you see is the backdrop of the post-industrial revolution era in Kendall Square, uh, around the canal, and really seeing the manufacturing industries that at the time were revolutionizing the world. At the time, those were the industries that MIT was partnering with in our mission to really solve these great challenges. And if you go by the inscription in Lobby 7, you will really read how MIT was founded with that in mind to solve the industrial challenges of the world. If you fast forward a few decades more, in 1960, 1970, the urban renewal process had kicked in. You see most of those buildings were raised and nothing was replacing it. There's a couple of buildings, signature buildings here that are important, I'm sure you are quite familiar with. One is where now is a home of Draper Lab. 
um, in kind of how they shape the building here by the string. And then the one that you can see that says the other around the transportation, that was supposed to be the NASA headquarters during um, President Kennedy's presidency, um, cut short. Now we have the headquarters here. And we'll talk more about the whole process with what Steve talks. So what happened next is quite extraordinary. And through a kind of a conjoint effort between many of the real estate developers, MIT, many of the stakeholders, <coughs> companies, and of course the city of Cambridge and the neighborhood, um, the transformation of the neighborhood around MIT has been magnificent. And it, it, what you see here in the picture is just to highlight the concentration effect, the density effect, the proximity effect. And those are the kinds of keywords that we want to keep using and referencing today to really think about how they translate back to the mission of MIT and the effectiveness of the mission of MIT. So this is a picture that how many of you were at Baker House? <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, I, I see you, I see you, I know you. Um, you may even participate in this piano drop, right? So this is the first piano drop in 1972, when I was a year old. Um, and, and I couldn't imagine that people at MIT would be experimenting with gravity. Right? That's what they were doing uh, with pianos that were not functioning. But that tradition, that quirkiness of our beloved MIT continues to be the um, And that was based also an interesting place. Because of this invention, ingenuity, people getting together, doing some fun stuff, a little quirky for many, but uh, not for us. And really thinking about the neighborhood and how we bring and translate that together. So what has been this MIT's distinct role in our DNA in the evolution of the neighborhood, in the evolution of Kendall, in the evolution of the combined neighborhood with Cambridge? So first, um, if you go from that evolution, historical picture that I showed you, um, we started early in 1960s and 1970s, and I think there are folks in the audience that were here actually quite central to some of these efforts. Um, that really MIT started investing in the neighborhood, in Technology Square, right at the time that people now um, have referenced um, Stanford and the Stanford development around Stanford. But what you see here is the same kind of ambition happening at MIT, perhaps in a much more difficult urban environment. You go to 1980, 1990, and what you see here is continued old debts. So I didn't say it when I mentioned the 1916 crossing, but at the time, that 7 million represented more than 50% of MIT's now. So here, what you see is MIT invested 5% of the endowment in 1980 1990 to acquire the land around University Park that we can now see um, also developing around the Kendall Main, uh, Main Street and Mass Ave, to the left of Mass Ave. In 2000, <clears throat> This is right about the time I came here to MIT. What you see is now Technology Square being reclaimed back um, by MIT and really investing more into the Technology Square area and how those buildings started to really get unhoused. What I would say is the last 20 years of evolution of company formation here in Kendall at MIT. So the first detail is this um, Novartis, at least 10,000 square feet in one of these buildings. Today, Novartis is the largest commercial tenant in Cambridge, period. Um, that 10,000 square feet was the first foray into the, what well, now has become the Novartis uh, Biomedical Research Institute uh, and bringing in the headquarters from Switzerland to Cambridge. <clears throat> we continue to invest. We continue to invest in what MIT for decades and for administrations um, have been investing in the land acquisitions that have enabled this possibility. So if you think about the psyche of MIT from 1916, why did MIT cross the river to begin with? Because it only had two buildings in the back then. And we had grown out of those two buildings. There was no space for MIT's ambitions to really be performed there. When it came here, every single administration since then has been really thinking about land acquisition as a mechanism to really expand the mission and the impact of MIT's mission. What you see here in the early 2000s, in 2006, 2010, around the Osborne Triangle, many of the old Polaroid <coughs> buildings are in this triangle. And what you see now is they are the home of uh, companies like Pfizer, Arcata Pharmaceuticals, Novartis, or even Black Central, um, a great innovation player around Kendall Square. <coughs> so these are developments that not only 
help with the densification of the ecosystem and the connectivity of the old ecosystem, but really also help MITs in its mission. So what these developments do to the endowment and to the investment of MITs, they bring dollars to the budget of MIT that can be then repurposed uh, for the mission and to enhance the academic inventions that happen. So think about a self-fulfilling cycle, which I will talk about um, next. So today, um, there's 19 million square feet around MIT. MIT's campus is about 13 million square feet. This is the academic campus. So we have a little bit more, like one, almost one and a half um, times the academic campus of MIT in really innovation plays, in industry, companies, startups, um, stakeholders supporting and enabling the kind of ambition that goes around not only MIT, but the entire area. And how the connectivity with the Cambridge neighborhoods uh, are supposed to really to work and to work together to bring in um, neighborhoods to be welcoming to them. And that's what many of these project features that we'll describe today are about. So what you see here is just a selection of some of the logos um, of the companies that are companies that are not only in the biotech space, I would say a lot of um, people think of Campus where just as a biotech cluster, it's an enormous biotech cluster. It's a magnificent biotech cluster. But it's not only a biotech cluster. It's a cluster of technology innovation. It's a cluster of robotics. It's a cluster of information technology. It's a cluster that any company that wants to work together close to our researcher that we give wants to have a stake in the ground. And it's a place in which every um, research staff, um, student, educated at MIT who dreams to change the world through entrepreneurship and impact and innovation wants to be in close proximity to the labs that were started. So what is this ecosystem of innovation that, that we keep ref uh, referring to? So we've distilled this, and there's lots of literature around it, but to the left side, this formula starts with talent. And it is, the talent has the capital of research on the right physical environment, and I'll describe some of those elements next. Um, that supports this self-fulfilling cycle of innovation and translation. What you see the benefits are tremendous, and what you see is, of course, all around the nation and the world, that everybody tries to replicate the vibrancy of a Kendall Square ecosystem like the one we have and enjoy today. So we're fairly privileged, but it's not happened by accident. And what we really want to um, show you today is that what it happened is through focused investment. Investment that goes all the way back to a century ago. And what we think is now the evolution of that investment and really the concentration factor. So the talent, of course, I, I'm not going to talk about the talent that exists at MIT. You know it to represent it. But there's more than that talent at MIT. There's all the other universities. There's all the students that come and go. There's all the graduates of these universities, many of which really decided to stay here. And many of us decide to take advantage of the high degree of element and, and situation in Boston, the greater Boston area that has to prove this. So there's more than, um, in fact, there's, I think, more than 400,000, when you take the greater Boston area, more than 400,000 students that really come here, study, and decide to really work in many of these ecosystems. The capital, <coughs> this doesn't discriminate the capital for biotech or IT, this is all capital. There are lots of statistics here. Um, this doesn't also talk about the corporate venture capital. This is the venture capital from private firms and private arms being supplied to the area. And the NIH funding, the largest region in the US, getting that the recipient of this, not just the universities, but the hospital systems that we have and that we benefit from. So when you put it all together, when you put it in the actual concentrated fields in which I showed you before in Kendall, biotech, bioengineering, engineering, IT, what you see is that multiplying effect going into the capital. So now you have this talent, now you have the capital, and now you have this element that we keep referring as a close proximity. So what happens if two people wanted to collaborate and they were 60 miles apart? It would be a lot harder. If they were 30 miles apart, I mean, what, imagine this is all happening within a one square mile radius. Um, all of this concentration is really what we talk sometimes we refer as the um, human collisions. So we want to improve the rate of human collisions around MIT. Within MIT, you can all go back to the architecture and design of the main group that's actually enabling that. And many will go back to that architecture and say that's one of the secrets of MIT, because there were no single building for this discipline of this department. There was no single element for that. It was all about cross-collaboration, interdisciplinary uh, research or not. 
what, think of that as an extension of that principle into the candle ecosystem. So people being able to free flow and talking to each other and talking within five minutes. Um, even when it's winter and it's not a day like today, um, people still do that. They go out and they get something. They get from food trucks or they get it from a, uh, another neighborhood uh, bakery. So how do we maintain our leadership? How do we keep doing more of what we do? Clearly, we have been benefit, we have been benefiting from the investments of the past and getting them to where we are today. How do we keep doing more? Uh, for those of you who do not recognize this picture, um, anyone from physics? Or, okay, so this is Ray Wise, um, Nobel Prize winner last year, for the, gravity, the proof of the gravitational waves. Um, I have to confess that I have a hard time even understanding what the gravitational waves are. But, but proving that they exist, it really what is amazing about meeting Ray is he dedicated an entire life to that proof. He dedicated an entire mission to when, in the face of adversity, of funding, of talent, of resources, of location, he kept going. He kept going for more than 35 years. Until then, one day, the LIGO experiment proved that he was right in his belief. This is a billion dollars of investment going into this system. It's an entire life going into this system, an entire life of this risk. And what you see today, what we are today and what we're benefiting from today, what I might be, is the integral of many lives dedicated to the institute, dedicated to expanding the mission of MIT and to the success of MIT. So to maintain this is what we need and we feel is the responsibility to keep investing, to keep dedicating our life to making this a possibility. What you see here is that investing in the place making and the capacity and the infrastructure, but also in the basic research. In the convergence that we talk about disciplines, in bringing all these disciplines up in the silo, to bringing them together to solve these issues, and really creating and providing the right tools, not only to our researchers, but to the community in the candle system. So an example of that that just opened last week um, is MIT 9. This is a tremendous facility. It's the best and the, it's the best research facility in our technology that's been now uh, constructed in the world. It took a thousand days, well, as of last week, we know it took 999 days um, to construct. And Nick Amster, our facilities manager, where, where he was in day 1000, because I couldn't sit here. I went home to rest, he said. Um, so this facility um, is not only activating more than 650 of our roughly 1,000 faculty, they all work in the nanotechnology field, but it's also designed to be open to the startups and to the research community that will be able to really facilitate um, all the development and innovation and translation of their ideas using our laboratory. This was never before possible at the scale that we have now invested in. This is also the fast forward of maybe 10 to 15 years of development, buildings, and investment. But what you see here has been publicized by Wired Magazine um, as a very singular corner um, at the street, kind of when you go to the confluence of Vassal Street, Main Street. Um, what you see here is two amazing institutes, the Whitehead Institute and the Berlin Institute. You see the Koch Institute right in front of it. Um, the MIT Department of Biology, Chemical Engineering, Data Center, the House of the Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab, and then the MIT Brain and Cognitive Sciences Complex, which houses the Montgomery Institute, the Peak Hour Institute, and the Department of Brain and Cognitive Science. What you see in this building and this investment, um, the first building you can see is 2004, 2006, all the way to 2011, uh, before we ever had those buildings there. And what you see now, um, if you get at any time around the day, you see the collaboration between computer scientists and biologists, between biologists and the sequencing elements of um, the genome at the Broad Institute. When you go from the Broad Institute to the Brain and Cognitive Sciences folks, you'll see work like Josh Tenenbaum on intelligence and human intelligence, and how we start modeling and advancing algorithmic processing as well as the impact of that algorithmic processing right here on campus. This is not one square mile. This is actually a fourth of one square mile that happens all right here. And then finally, um, what you see is also, of course, back to the talent, is the concentration and dedication of the lives of many people um, using the tools, um, like makerspaces, and a lot of the, the resources that MIT has, like MIT now, as I mentioned, 
But what you see is the dedication of the people that work in these programs, in innovation, in initiatives, um, elements that really support the entrepreneurship and the activation of the innovation genes around MIT. Um, somebody made a calculation that would spend more than a million hours on it. Uh, I'm not going to back it up in an MIT way. But um, that seems about right. We spend a lot of time community-wise to support our students, our researchers, and our faculty in developing and helping them go and commercialize faster and better from their laboratories and research. So let me stop here. I think uh, invite the panelists uh, for the next round. I'm Nate Jefferson, I'm Vice President for Communications. Uh, I will moderate this panel. I'm always struck, uh, Israel, when I, when I see presentations on Pendle, uh, how far back the thinking behind Pendle goes at MIT. Um, okay, you've got an amazing uh, panel to hear from today. Let me introduce some proof to BFC Marsh, Managing, Direct Managing Director of Real Estate for MIT. We have Katie Ray, CEO and Managing Partner of The Engine. We have uh, Liz Reynolds, Executive Director of MIT Industrial Performance Center. We have Muriel Maydard. She is Cecil Green Professor of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science here at MIT. And we have Mr. Ruiz. So here's, here's what we'll do. Each of our panelists will um, present briefly. Uh, I'll then ask them a couple of questions, and then we'll open it up um, to the floor. I believe we begin with, uh, let's see. Great, thanks, Shane. Um, you know, I'm just going to just walk us through basically what's been a 60-year journey in terms of uh, transformation at Square. And, you know, I'm happy to say what I've done. We have a lot left to do. But I think uh, if you look at this map, this is uh, essentially MIT's land holders in Cambridge. Uh, the blue is the campus. Uh, the gold is the innovation spaces that MIT has invested in over the last 60 years. So today, if you look at that, uh, we have facilitated about 7.5 million square feet of innovation space in Cambridge, which is about a third of the central business district in, in uh, East Cambridge. Uh, Israel walked you through a little bit of, you know, we started at Technology Square, which you can see in the middle of the, uh, of the map. Uh, we moved to University Park um, in the uh, 70s, 80s, and 90s, and then gravitated back to the Osborne Triangle, where we were really trying to get academia and industry to get closer together to facilitate uh, communication and innovation. Today we're working on Kendall Square, which many of you know about. You can see it outside. Uh, we're in the midst of launching a number of the activities uh, along Main Street. And then ultimately we will talk a little bit about the Volpe site as well. You know, we spent a lot of time in this 60-year journey. I've been here for 19 years, in the, in the past 19 years. Uh, and one of the things we stopped when Kendall happened to stop and pause and say, hey, you know, what's missing? What's missing in Kendall Square? We certainly know we need innovation space. We need places for our entrepreneurs to be, uh, to be housed, to be able to support innovation. We need R&D capacity broadly in the Kendall Square area. But we're also cognizant of the fact that all the innovation is done by people, and people need great places. So we're focused today on things like retail, housing, open space, making the right connections, programming, and trying to create a sustainable community. If you look at what is happening, Kendall, this is just a depiction of uh, the finished product at Kendall Square. Um, basically, six buildings uh, plus some rehabilitation of one Broadway in this, in this site. In this uh, development, we have 450 graduate units being placed right on the T stop on Main Street. Uh, we're preserving historic buildings, uh, housing a lot of the MIT activities of innovation and entrepreneurship and, and MIT admissions. Um, we're building 300 units, approximately 300 units of market rate and affordable housing over the parking lot on Broadway, bringing in about 100,000 square feet of retail to activate the streets, almost two acres of open space, having the opportunity to knit together, you know, everything from the internet corridor, extending from the medical building all the way through the Sloan School and outdoor uh, public, uh, public realm improved space. Um, huge transformation. Uh, underway today, you see the graduate dormitory happening and some of the uh, research and development buildings done in a bunch of retail out there. If you look forward, Volpe is a site we just recently engaged with the federal government to secure. 
We, uh, last year, we were entitled to the process with the city of Cambridge and the Cambridge community to re-establish uh, the zoning regime for what would be built on the site. It will house eventually 2.8 million square feet of mixed use development. This is the hole in the donut in Kendall Square, the opportunity to take a 14 acre site that was basically cordoned off from all of the community and be able to open it up and provide mixed use activity. Over 1,400 units of housing will be placed on the site, will activate Kendall Square in an enormous fashion. Uh, another 125,000 square feet of retail will give us the opportunity think about things like uh, entertainment and arts uh, that we have not had enough room in certain parts of Kendall Square. Uh, two and a half acres of open space, a community center, inviting the community in to join with the MIT community and the <coughs> community in Volpe. It'll take a decade to do it, and we'll follow Kendall Square. To give you some sense, what we're trying to do is activate the streets. This is a rendering of Main Street. You can see the historic buildings uh, where the MIT Press uh, was located and the new graduate dormitory. Uh, what we're doing here, again, is to try to create an improved public realm. We're brought with care uh, the floors of these historic buildings down to grade, to get us a, you know, a diversified storefronts uh, around, along Main Street. Uh, the MIT Museum will be located in the new uh, uh, R&D building uh, at the uh, Kendall Key Stop. And this will, we hope, activate this portion of, of Main Street and provide some vibrancy. Other things that we're adding in Kendall, uh, this is a rendering on the lower right of uh, the garage across the street at Broadway. If anybody's walked out there today, you'll see steel going up. Uh, that is where the new Roach Brothers Marketplace will go in. The two things we heard over and over again in our planning was please, please bring the grocer and bring the drugstore to Kendall Square. So that is a major commitment. We're signed uh, Roach Brothers over there. It'll be open in a year. Uh, you know, we're really excited about that. But that's a, a sense of the attitude about trying to improve the space. We're going to try to provide these amenities. At the end of the day, we're trying to provide places for, for people to, you know, to gather, and socialize, and collaborate in Kendall Square. I want to just show you the retail and the public realm because it gives a sense of the changes here. This is the existing condition. You can see a long main street. This was mostly, you know, there's a few places for lunch, but mostly banks and financial services in Kendall Square. Uh, not a lot of places to actually gather. As we go through and do the Kendall Square uh, innovation activity, you'll see that we dramatically improve the footprints. The footprints of these buildings are larger. They allow us to activate essentially all four corners of the buildings. We're providing open space through the middle of, of the campus, uh, essentially extending the infinite corridor. And it gives us the footprints to put things like a grocer, or a drugstore, or a few other of the larger uh, occupants in, in Kendall Square. But people approached us about other things that were in Kendall, and frankly, we didn't have enough space. So there's still things that love to be done. And the Volpe site gives us an opportunity to extend all of these principles further onto an additional 10 acres. If you now see the Volpe uh, incorporated into this plan, we have an opportunity to bring another two and a half acres of open space. We may actually be able to create a square in Kendall Square. Uh, we're excited about that. But the opportunity to make the connections through a site that was impenetrable up until this point in time to create retail that may encompass things, as I said, entertainment, arts, a variety of things that will extend the hours in, in Kendall is very, very important. So with this, again, our notion along with what Israel has talked about 60 years in the journey to support innovation we're trying to gather people together. We're trying to get them to socialize and collaborate. You know, humans do a better job of solving problems when they do it together with other talented people. So we're trying to make this journey one of creating an innovation community where everyone is included. So I'll just stop there and pass the baton. Thank you. Called the engine, and we're really focused on top tech. So, you know, these are things that are coming out of MIT labs and other labs that are innovating in spaces that generally come out of the physical sciences. So, but very broad. So, I'll take you through just a couple minutes of what we're up to there. Uh, I know I see a lot of friendly faces in the audience, but happy to talk to people afterwards more in depth if that's necessary. So. 
Uh, about a year ago, we opened the engine officially. We're actually located uh, down in Central Square, right on Mass Ave, above the little donkey, if any of you live here. And it's about 30,000 square feet of space, both lab and office space, where our founders gather to build top tech companies. Uh, you know, the reason for our existence is if you look at what's happened in the funding cycles, there are two main areas of funding that have gotten major momentum. That's software, I think you've all seen that, both consumer and B2B software, and pharmaceutical investments. If you look at the rest of the investment cycle, it's been flat or down. And that's in many areas where MIT is a world leader in the research. So, you know, things in physics and things in uh, biology beyond pharmaceutical, et cetera. I mean, I'll go on and on. But, uh, so when we founded the engine, it was essentially to say, could we start to tilt that? I think of it as a market correction. If we began to invest very early into top tech companies, could we change some of the trajectory of what gets built here in Kendall Square? Because we, I think we all believe that these are some of the most important areas of research and investment and could change the world. So why not keep them here? Um, you know, this is a, a classic graph which basically says there's a ton of grant research, there's a ton of venture capital money. But if you don't take out the engineering risk in the center, you don't ever access those large pools of private capital. So that's the market correction. Could we fix some of that here and get the companies from research to commercialization? We think the answer is yes, but we think there's a bunch of systems that need to be created to support top tech companies that have greater technical risk. Um, so the engine we set out with a set of founders that we invested into to create a system, a platform that we thought would be very helpful to them. And we did this in conjunction with them. So, you know, the first thing is we needed baby capital. And there's just no way around that. It's unfortunate, but sure, uh, that, that the baby capital gets started. So we raised a fund, we raised a little over $200 million. Then the next thing we knew they needed was kind of a program. So there are some incredible entrepreneurial programs at MIT that we are very grateful that they exist. And there's venture mentoring services, and there's a bunch of incredible resources. But once the companies are up and going, we think that they need more. They need that peer-to-peer -peer relationship, peer-to-peer -peer learning, as they begin to scale their companies. And so we created a program that we think is helpful to the founders in top tech areas. The next thing, and, and MIT did this in, I think, an incredible way, is they said, hey, there's a lot of very expensive equipment that might have cycles that go unused on campus. Could we start to open up that, those machines to startups? So we found this one called the engine room. And that, that is taking different um, machines in different labs and making them open to startups. We started with the engine startups but we hope to make that more broadly available to top tech companies in the region. So it allows them to not buy that equipment, but to just simply rent it. Uh, and the next thing is we know that top tech companies need a very broad network in order to succeed. And that network includes both large corporations, government funding, other top tech startups, and, and mentors and experts. So we have a, a, a network that we created for our startups as well. We've now invested into 13 startups. We're about to close 14 and 15. This, these are broadly diverse companies. The majority come out of MIT or MIT-affiliated labs, but it's not exclusive to MIT. I think that's part of when you saw Israel's map of connecting all the universities and labs we are so close, and many of the MIT professors already collaborate across institutions. But what you see is incredible founders, many of them PhDs and postdocs who are starting their first company, often in collaboration with a faculty member here. 
but they're doing incredibly ambitious work across many, many industries. So, for instance, the most, I would say the most tough of tough tech is fusion. So, probably many of you saw the article about Cottonwell Fusion. We've been a part of helping that company get off the ground. And that was many, many decades of research uh, in, in fusion here at MIT. And one of the out, outputs of that was a startup. You know, the first round of that startup has to take $100 million to get it through to produce the first magnet. Uh, it's a very new way of creating fusion reactors. What's so cool about it is it is this beautiful collaboration between MIT, this startup, and a very industrial company called NH, which is an oil and gas company. It will take all of those people plus government funding to create an important next generation company. It's essentially a miniaturized tokamak to produce endless energy. If they succeed, think about what a wonderful thing that is for our economy, for the economies around the world. So cool. And the fact that it's coming out of MIT, even better. And the fact that it could be built, at least the start of it, in the center of a city is even more interesting to me. So when they begin to do the first assembly of the magnet, it will be in the center of the city. By the time they have a tokamak, they need a very specialized building. But to start here allows them to collaborate in a very deep way uh, across our different departments. And it also allows them to attract young talent into, into fusion, which is very, very important. You know, we go from that all the way to self-driving cars, things coming out of the brain cognitive science um, center, things coming out of chemical engineering, biological engineering. And, you know, I have the privilege to work with these early founders in, in really trying to create next generation, long-term big companies that I think will be fundamental to our economy here and, and to the ambition of MIT. Uh, top tech is super broad. I mean, it touches things like advanced manufacturing, always semiconductors, quantum computing, AI, materials, energy. These are all things that have some kind of physical instantiation, massive ambition, and take breakthrough science and engineering to get off the ground and be an important company. So that's what we do at the engine. Uh, many alum are involved in a whole set of ways, and we feel very grateful for that. And I look forward to the end of the day. Thank you. Um, so my name is Miriam Meadard, and I lead the network coding and reliable communications group at the Institute of Black Modern Economics. Uh, and I have two hats, one as a faculty member. Uh, in the context of being a faculty member, I've also uh, operated on several um, uh, MIT sort of um, uh, what, what, what I would call faculty expert workers, which is committees. Uh, and they're not as fun as the expert other expert workers, but they're still uh, extremely rewarding. Um, but, and uh, both on the campus planning committee, actually, I was the, the chair of the initial campus planning committee. Uh, and also a lot on the student life. So I was the chair of the faculty student life committee and also the chair of the institute committee uh, on student life. So that's one hat. Uh, but the hat I'm going to show you today is actually the entrepreneur hat. Um, we've heard a lot about um, MIT affiliated uh, startups. Uh, and indeed, I have co founded a one such startup that I'll talk, talk to you about. Uh, and it's particularly interesting in this context because we make use uh, quite crucially of um, Cambridge Innovation Center, uh, CIC, that we've seen on several of the maps, and of the type of ecosystem that you've heard the other speakers refer to. Uh, so it's called Code On, kind of like Rock On, but just a little less rockish. Uh, and uh, what we do is I rented the new network coding. Um, which is a technology that's come out of MIT and several other uh, universities.
case. So we've heard about the, the university ecosystem. Um, this is Ms. MIT Caltech, uh, TU Dresden. Um, but you know, many of the other ecosystem universities that you've heard about, such as Harvard, uh, Northeastern, and so on, also included uh, in this set of intellectual property and technology. Um, one of the things that's interesting here, I think, with respect to the issue of uh, proximity and making use very actively of a sort of geographically enabled ecosystem, um, is that we work with uh, technology licensing offices at MIT and also at, um, at other universities uh, to have aggregated the intellectual property related to uh, randomly network coding. Um, keep it at a minimum, so I'll show you one slide later uh, about what the technology is, and then just one slide to uh, show you some applications, which I think uh, are, are exciting and very, uh, very good illustrations of the usefulness. Um, so, in effect, there, what we're really doing is aggregating intellectual property and then making use of that intellectual property to enable uh, companies, both existing companies. Uh, and in case of those existing companies, they get a license, in which case uh, MIT, of course, I uh, guess a big chunk of that licensing. Uh, or they also license with a requirement to do some of the um, uh, consulting and design that's needed to incorporate the technology into those companies' uh, products. Um, many of the people who work for us are MIT alumni, uh, either um, as students, so increasingly, of course, we have a large body of postdocs, so they might be what I call postdoc alumni. Um, so basically, as I said, we're, we're founded uh, at CIC, um, and the, the aspect that I think is particularly interesting to us is also while at CIC, we end up running into a huge number of other entrepreneurs. I see many um, alumni, old friends, and other faculty members there. Uh, and you know that sort of uh, impromptu, I forgot what you call it, bumping into something. <laughs> so, so you know that, that, that sort of happy innovation brown emotion uh, sort of is is, uh, is very tangible and uh, and something that that we get to, to enjoy and, and benefit from. Um, so this is something where I think the, our ability to have positive traction in the market is really uh, benefited from. Uh, being at CIC, um, from being close to several companies that we interact with. It's happened more than once that one of the companies that's interested uh, or using our technology is actually right there in that sort of general area that we've seen highlighted uh, multiple times this morning. Uh, so that really facilitates our interactions. What's interesting though is that you know, there is a knock-on effect um, I mentioned that we work with existing companies that are sort of two, two different parts to our activities. The second part of the activity is we enable startups which use our technology, licensing, for very specific products. In that case, we, really, we, we let the, the startups basically develop their own, their own product and just assist them as they need to. Some of the startups have been here in Massachusetts from Ramona. Uh, many of them actually are in Europe. Um, and they come over regularly uh, simply because being in this environment really helps them. So, so there's something where uh, the geographic proximity that we see is benefiting in a way companies that are very far directly from us but keep those connections. So there's a, there's a very interesting thing going on with that. Uh, I promise that I keep it clean and shall. Uh, so how does it work? Um, basically, what we do is we change the paradigm of the uh, internet, which currently is really based around uh, something which is close to transportation. Much of the map actually originally came from the 1950s style uh, transportation and kind of all operations research uh, style uh, map. Uh, and what we do is we instead make use of the fact that when you transmit data, data is algebraic. Uh, and uh, you know we can make use of that algebraic structure in effect, you know, the fact that bits are just a type of Galois field of uh, size two, uh, and we make use of that actively inside the network. It enables a huge number of uh, other 
um, long-term effects, uh, not just true birth, but reliability. And I'll just give you one example. This is a work some work that we're doing right now. It's funny, we heard about the farm of transportation. We work actually quite closely right now um, with the um, system that's being um, piloted uh, out of, it's, it's actually companies, but the impetus is a new Department of Transportation uh, safety features that, that are coming along. And in particular, as you can imagine, one of the things you don't want is people hacking into your car. Um, just, I'll give you a few seconds to imagine the car. Um, so, um, in, uh, in New York City, right now, there's 9,000 devices installed in vehicles. Um, they share safety and other uh, information um, uh, among each other and to each other. Uh, and basically, that's, that, that's one of the, the parties we're in, uh, involved in, and it's extremely important that robustness and security be maintained. Uh, and I'll leave it at that. Work, as well as a lot of precision commodity work. 
But here's the, the advanced manufacturing ecosystems, if you will, that we're working with. And the question is, well, how do we advance this? So we went and looked at how, what were the drivers of innovation for this ecosystem. And we found four key sort of drivers, if you will, of knowledge and innovation. At the top are small and medium-sized firms that are actually helping make our prototypes and our first uh, um, piloting facilities, if you will. Our OEMs, the large firms, the original equipment manufacturers, our startups, and of course our universities and research institutes, <coughs> of which we have many. And the question is, how do these all relate? How do we actually um, connect the dots between these, and how can we enhance them? And so in a very stylized way, we, through our interviews and um, analysis of some of the work going on in the region, we started to look at where does information come from, where does knowledge come from, and where are the relationships between these, these entities. So for example, in terms of knowledge flow, small and medium-sized firms have very relatively little amount of knowledge that's flowing to the large companies. But the large companies are often driving a lot of the knowledge into new technologies, et cetera, to the small and medium-sized firms. We have a lot of you know, bilateral relationships between our universities and our large firms. We have OEMs driving some information to startups, but really startups drive a lot of new knowledge and innovation to the OEMs. Um, and then universities work very strongly, obviously, with the startups, less so with the SMEs. Um, and the question for us is, how do we expand this? Oh, sorry. And so um, what we have here is kind of a, a, a facile um, example of our innovation ecosystem with, of course, investors as well as integrators, accelerators, et cetera, as part of this. And I would add at this point also, I think we have to be very careful about our training and education systems, how they feed into this, because that's an important piece. But when we look at this and ask ourselves, well, where is Kendall Square, or where is um, the Cambridge Boston area, if you will, in, in promoting and supporting this ecosystem, what has been very interesting in our interviews is to find out the importance of, um, of this region, this area, for those startups, and for them, not just starting as a uh, case, but for what might be called the next stage of the nursery. How do we keep those firms that we have now a few more people involved uh, are, are beyond the prototype, but really benefit from being in the ecosystem that the Camp Kendall Square area affords. In the last five years, since we identified this problem in advanced manufacturing, broadly, which was the last administration's major agenda, um, but as well as you know, MIT's agenda, we have seen enormous investments at many levels to help support this ecosystem and the scale-up process. We have uh, venture capital in the form of Bolt, we have uh, private sector firms like Autodesk and Flex creating um, innovation spaces. We have maker spaces that are uh, being developed. We have, of course, the engine, which is one of the most innovative uh, institutions you're going to find in the world, I think, to address these questions. We have the federal and state governments stepping in with a lot of the manufacturing innovation institutes. And here at MIT, we're supporting FOA, which is focused on smart fabrics. In all these ways, we see the ecosystem stepping up and helping support this larger advanced manufacturing ecosystem and finding its place in trying to push that innovation here in, the, in this urban area, but also supporting then the, the building from here into the larger network that I showed early on. So this is an area this is, that we're focused on is trying to figure out how, what is the role that others play in trying to support and grow this uh, this ecosystem, how do we develop more spillovers in this process? And I think we'll talk a little bit about the role of, of various uh, players in doing that. Thank you.
um, you know, we will be able to create an environment where our community helps us solve problems at the end of the day. So I would say we're excited about the prospects at Kendall uh, <coughs> Square. Um, yeah, great. Um, and I will ask you, I'm going to ask, I'm try to ask everybody if you have time, uh, what keeps you up tonight? <laughs> I sleep like a baby. You know, I would tell you, if you think about just walking the site out there, you know, we're going six levels below ground. Uh, you get water about uh, six feet. Uh, we're going 300 feet in the air. Uh, we're building um, facilities you know, 10 feet from the MBTA red line. Uh, we've got graduate housing, we've got residential housing here, we've got all MITs, utilities, and communication. There isn't a thing out there that, uh, I, you know, from a daily basis that we get a new problem every day. So I would say that the, the wonderful thing about uh, this is that I have a great team. Michael is here, uh, I know, we all know, uh, and a number of other people on my team who work tirelessly along with all the people that uh, Israel's uh, uh, domain and the facilities group who are working to make this thing work. We're changing 36 acres of territory in Kendall Square. And that's a lot of change. I think ultimately the change will be good, but sometimes you go through a couple of pain points along the way. So we have lots of things to say right tonight, but we're good people and I'm convinced we'll get to the end uh, and it will be successful. So okay, the the engine is um, is doing something really distinctive. Um, it's um, it's a really exciting um, uh, endeavor and it's all around this, this idea of top tech, right? So I guess I just uh, I want to know from your point of view and from the point of view of the, of the, the, the early days founders that you're talking to, what is it about being Kendall that really works for them? What are you learning about that as you, as you guys really get off the ground? Yeah, I mean, you know, if you think about it, logical distance need a lot of space. So people think, oh, they should be outside the city. But I think the reality that all of our founders face is they are working on very challenging technical problems. And that takes bringing some of the smartest people in the world around those problems, which, by the way, they're sitting in buildings in Kendall Square. And they're, they're in all different types of disciplines. So the fact that a team could find the best people to figure out a mechanical problem, a chem chemical problem, and a biological problem, all in this you know, half square mile or square mile, allows companies to go much, much faster and you know, the way we think of it is the first four years of the startup are when you have to face some of your biggest technical challenge. And if they're out, way out, it means they're either driving in or recruiting people to drive out there. That makes it much harder. And so you know, we've heard this from faculty or founders. We've heard this from the CEOs of the company, is that it's so much easier to recruit in the center of the city and it's so much easier to collaborate across disciplines with other experts. And so we just think that's, that's the heart of it. And so we have to keep people in these close, dense areas. And there's really no better place than you know, Kendall or East Cambridge, as Steve would say. Like, this whole area, um, I think, you know, needs to be open to really starting these tough tech companies. There will be a moment where you need to build a very large factory that's going to be tough in Kendall Square. But I don't know. Who knows what happens from here? But you know, you know, you also see these trends around miniaturization. Our hope is that we can manufacture metals here at very small scale. You could have small token ads. I mean, this whole miniaturization and putting it close to the population center, I think that trend is going to continue. It makes a lot of sense. So, you know, uh, I don't know what the future is going to bring, but I know that if we don't keep these startups close to where their collaborators are, they will have much less chance of succeeding. So I'm just going to follow up on that. So, that, um, so, so you've got these founders, and they're, um, and they're working hard on their this sort of single idea, and they're interacting with lots of people who are not going to be necessarily part of their company, but who they can learn from and interact with. How is that all going? How is that network? Kind of beginning to get established. So, you know, everything we do, we, we do it from the perspective of the founders. So that's why when we first started, we we're like, you know what, our systems are going to be super mature. Let's learn what these founders need. So, literally, 
the way we're building this is to say, what do these first 7, 10, 13, 15 companies need? And then build the connectivity around that. So what that immediately starts you with the large corporations and doing, you know, joint development agreements between a startup and a large corporation. It brings you into the manufacturing realm. Like how do you outsource building pieces of this? So that starts to connect what, what Liz was talking about, which is kind of all these contract manufacturers who are extremely skilled in building pieces of a system and are expert in that. So you don't have to build your whole team. But that's, we just, and then you start building in this layer of experts in certain areas. So we just think of it as like you just keep starting from the center of the founders, building out what they need. And that just becomes a denser and denser network over the years. So that's just how I conceptualize it. Great. Um, and I will before we want to ask you what you two have meant. Founder success, I mean, the whole system always comes down to like, Will these founders succeed? If they do, this will just keep going and going and be a wonderful thing, I think, to MIT, Kendall Square, and kind of the next generation of companies. But we have to work incredibly hard to make sure the founders get what they need. Do they get the next round of funding? Do they get the talent? You know, think about quantum computing. Like, our one of our services is like, we need to develop more talent in quantum computing. If we don't, the company can't grow as fast as it should. Right? So that's talent development. I mean, I just, I carry the founders' worries. And it, they're very broad and very deep. But we live in the most connected place in the world. So I always say to the founders, like, you are in the best place to have these problems. Um, you know, ask for help because it's sitting right here and, and around us. Great, thank you. Here I'll go to Houston to an next in the presentation. So if it, if it were like maybe a, a single uh, reason that Codon likes to be in Kendall, is there that single reason or there are a couple of reasons why it's a good place for them to be located? Yeah, uh, I think the proximity, again, it, it sounds silly, it sounds simplistic, really. Yeah. Uh, but that, that really does make a lot of difference. As I said, we work closely with the MIT Technology Office. Uh, but we also work with a lot of alumni who have stayed in the area. Uh, and also faculty at other universities, not just MIT, but also Harvard. So being able to have people come over easily, you know, as, as you were mentioning, in terms of not having to, to ask people to, to make a day of it, but just to be able to have a meeting for an hour or two and get on with the other things that they're doing. But it really does make a lot of difference, you know, that sort of small granularity meetings uh, rather than uh, having to go very far afield. And the second reason that I would mention is, again, the fact that for a lot of companies that we talk to or partner with, Either the right people all for us to talk to already in the area, or the company has at least some presence in the area, which facilitates their coming over to see us uh, versus having to maybe do a much more complicated trip. You know, not, not that we don't have those, of course, um, but, but that's a much higher overhead as well. Mm -hmm. Great. Any other comments? I'm going to ask you what these two have meant. <laughs> I have four kids. <laughs> <laughs>
But the fact is we have the capabilities here as well, and in fact there are advantages, particularly of new advanced manufacturing technologies that are bringing back uh, and really have limited our backs in terms of being able to make a lot of this here. So we see these new emerging um, models, if you will, that are nudging uh, people to work together. So for example, the Germans have always been very good at bringing a large company, the research institution, and a small or medium-sized company together in their innovation and their R&D. We haven't historically done that. These new manufacturing innovation institutes are requiring that startups and SMEs are part of their um, R&D applications. And so they're sort of bringing in our small and medium-sized manufacturers to get them up to speed on the technology. Same thing with the startups and the um, Pioneer Valley and our capabilities in precision engineering. We now have Green Town Labs and others who have created programs to try and bridge that gap which feels so far away, but it's a couple hours in terms of our capability, capabilities that way. So there are lots of different ways in which we're actually trying to build the, as a sort of case, build that infrastructure that supports the connectivity and, and make that um, work better and actually take advantage of what is now becoming a uh, renaissance of manufacturing in this country. I, I mentioned, for example, the, you know, the epicenter of 3D printing globally is now in, the, is in this area. And so you know, what that means for uh, small batch production, what that means for our companies uh, going forward, uh, I think is, is really exciting. So, so what is the hard, so, so about that, um, that kind of um, uh, promise of rebirth on manufacturing, what's, what is sort of the most difficult about that? Uh, well, interestingly, you know, uh, so I was just out in Ohio interviewing companies, and it's a good time to be interviewing small manufacturers. Like, we're just at our back, the economy is doing great, um, and it's uh, it, the issue of Capital is not uh, terrible right now, and even the issue of skills and upskilling, which we thought, you know, we keep talking about skilling. People, we figured out, we're figuring out how to upskill. We have online videos for 20 minutes. We have our community college. We have all of that is going on. I think it's actually access to this technology, learning about it, figuring out how do you how do you bring it into your firm. A lot of these firms are not in a situation where they really understand that. So can we accelerate that process? A little bit more. When we do, um, you know, we're seeing. I think we're going to see a lot of exciting work going on. Um, so Israel, if I may, the, um, the the work we've, we've we've seen you describe and talked about here um, <coughs> is pretty amazing. Did you ask what I was saying? We, I was saying she. So I don't know if you noticed know, this. I actually did ask her the, what keeps you up at night question in a different way <laughs> after the after last time. I asked. Well, I actually like to respond to that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what keeps you up at night is partly the new hat I'm wearing at MIT, which is I'm co-leading with David Auger and David Mendel. MIT's Institute-wide Initiative on Work in the Future, uh, which is looking at this relationship between technology, work, and society. And what keeps me up at night is the growing inequality in the society and the challenge of bringing all of us to the study of work to the less educated, lower skilled workers uh, of this community and, you know, largely in our, in our country. And we have to make active steps and in all the ways we're making active steps and other ways to make this work for the community we're talking about, we really have to make those active steps to make sure the sports for everybody in our community. Great. Um, so Israel, I want to ask you a question about the, um, the Kendall as a gateway to MIT. So with all this work, there's a way to, there's an opportunity to think about what makes a, 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 a really good gateway. Mm -hmm. So I, I'd love your thoughts on that. Well, I mean, I think there's no um, secret in this audience that if you were to direct somebody to the main app of MIT, you would probably direct them to set up the center mass app, right? And that would be a fairly monumental and on scale to the campus. Um, what we aspire to do with Kendall, I think what's been um, the difficult, you know, the challenging um, work is to create a different gateway of the same um, caliber, but with very different set of characteristics. We're not going to have those monumental staircases into a building like the ones of the main group. So I think what we've been debating, and I think uh, a lot of people have to intuited their thoughts, um, those that seek stuff to run in our own uh, school of architecture and planning, those have participated very heavily, is in creating this unique and distinctive characteristics of what that game would be. Um, and you think about what that is, is really the uh, intersection of these buildings that you've seen, you've seen rendered in Steve's slides. Um, together with um, Isabella, we have this um, from the T, from the Kendall Square, right? And how does 
the articulation of the two buildings, what goes into the ground floor of those two buildings, and how that connects architecturally, visually, and you think from like what is called an area plaza or elsewhere, how do you attract that head cows and how does it connect all together? So those pieces um, have to do with programmatically. Um, we brought the MIT Museum idea as one way to really um, think about it, and this afternoon there's a groundbreaking for that building, very exciting um, uh, moment. Um, think about the MIT Museum, the traffic that comes with it, um, the dissemination uh, potential of that MIT Museum right at the Kendall entrance. And then think about what goes on the other side, uh, which is the academic building side. And we put out the MIT admissions, um, the MIT welcome, uh, there will be MIT welcome center, um, there will be the innovation and entrepreneurship hub. So think about the activities that will go around that gateway, and now think and connect that to the public art and the characteristics of the head house, which uh, I couldn't see rendered very well here, but it, it's a beautiful rendering that uh, will connect and think about lighting, think about other kinds of projections that will have um, the MIT character all around that entrance. So now think of that as an inviting place into the campus and an open space that we've never had before. The open space behind the building on Main Street will be the largest open space and the first time that we actually have one person who is in the audience, Jess, uh, who will be directing the activation of that open space. Not just it will be an open space for us to enjoy, enjoy which we will, but we will program that open space so that the neighbors um, in the Cambridge, the neighbors in the port, the neighbors in Cambridge and Boston and our community will be part of it. So think of that gateway as an always on, always active uh, element of the campus infrastructure. It's a tall order, but if you think about it, the next and final objective that Stephen and I have is that somebody comes out of the team, they will no longer, no longer ask where I'm going. I'm so Israel, what keeps you up tonight? <laughs> So when Steve doesn't take my call. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, maybe more seriously, I think there are two things that I feel very passionate about and I think hopefully that comes across, but um, talent and resources were at the top. Right? And in this day and age, I think we see barriers to access the best talent in the world to come to MIT and to be at MIT and to be welcome at MIT. Um, as an administration, I think we work tirelessly for that to be the case, because that has been the history of MIT, and it will continue to be the history of this very amazing, innovative place that we all um, love so much. And then resources is another one. It's a little bit of the, um, the problem we have by becoming successful. Now, it, it does feel that everybody will see our endowment and our resources as the resource for the problems. And that that is, I will say, sure, we have and we're privileged to have the resources we have, but those resources flow back, all of them and more, into the ambitions and the mission of MIT. So if we cannot go and pay financially for our undergraduates, if we cannot go and invest the $500 million that MIT Nano cost, uh, if we cannot go and invest the kinds of resources we need to to attract and retain the best promising graduate student or faculty member in PCS, um, that impacts on my And that takes a lot more effort than it used to be in the past uh, few years. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, we're about to open it up to uh, questions or microphones over here, but while, while you think about asking a question, let me ask our panelists, is there anything I um, didn't ask you that you wish I had asked you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Covered all the territory, yes. OK, well, we will open it up now. There are microphones uh, on the stairs. Good morning. Yeah, I'm start over here. Good morning. Uh, thanks very much for sharing the exciting vision. I'm sure it will, will be successful for MIT. As a member of the community, um, I'm, I guess, interested that none of you are kept up at night by the questions related to transportation. Either you're really good delegators, or you have some really good ideas about how we're going to get people to a front end square. I'm hoping that maybe you can share some of the thinking on that. Actually, that was our pre-conversation before this. It's like, wow, I'm really glad we got here on top. All of us. At least we made it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'll start. Um, you know, I think we think about it quite a bit. Um, you know, 
one of the things that uh, is clear is that it would help to have better transportation in Town Square. I think uh, recently in our OB uh, rezoning exercise, we spent a lot of time uh, thinking and talking about that. We made some major contributions to transportation. We, uh, I think, by the way, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think our numbers with respect to things on the Grand Junction and the transportation is almost $17 million. I think we spent a lot of time uh, trying to, you know, the transportation network uh, is really governed by the state government. I think we've spent a lot of time trying to lobby the state government any way we can. Uh, we are delighted that um, we'll be seeing some new red line trains in Kendall, which should uh, really help with the throughput. I think it's something like 1% additional capacity just with new trains and signals at, you know, a, a substantial investment by the state of, you know, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars in that. I think you know we've um, made it clear that the Grand Junction Railroad that we only uh, big chunk of uh, that will uh, open that up um, and, and dialogue with the city and the state to talk about you know community path, bike path, and reserving the rights for future transportation. Yeah, so that is hope in an area, but it will require funding well beyond the means of MIT or any, frankly, any individual organization. I think that's a government uh, exercise. I think a lot of the bike paths you see out there are funded by the work that we're doing in a variety of other alternative means of getting to work. Um, creating housing, I think that helps as well. Having more of the population reside locally. That's not possible in every instance, as we all know. But all of those, I think it's going to be, you know, across every front, we're going to have to think about that. And it's going to be not just MIT, it's going to be MIT in a dialogue with state, city, uh, and, the, and the federal government and the rest of the constituencies here. It is a big problem, it's a big challenge. And, Everyone's focused on it. I don't think we have an ideal, singular, simple solution to what we're doing. Thanks. I wonder how the panel will come contracts uh, Kendall Square to Silicon Valley, especially in the light of attracting talent, entrepreneur, so that maybe the future of Facebook will stay in Boston instead of heading to Silicon Valley. Oh boy. Oh boy. <laughs> well, let me start. I think every one of us has um, probably a formal answer to that. And I mean, first of all, I don't think that we see it as a raise against Silicon Valley uh, anyone, but what we do see it is as a way for the founders in tech tech, especially but in other cases, to have the options and the strongest options in the Boston area. Um, I think uh, we've been working to understand that and what it takes for them to be. Um, if you go back 20 years ago, in the dog era of the late 90s, uh, I think the availability of capital and the availability of a lot of support um, infrastructure that we've been discussing, all of us as panelists, um, was much limited, right? Here versus um, Silicon Valley. I think those, and in particular for certain industries, and we've talked about biotech, and we've talked about advanced manufacturing, and we've talked about many of the areas that we're talking, um, I think that that balance um, has either completely balanced or actually inverted towards this area. Um, and I think the epicenter is certainly what you start seeing is movement of companies like biotech companies and some top tech companies moving actually not west but east um, towards this area. And that has never happened in history. So this is, these are important moments. These are important moments not only west to east, but also from Europe or Asia to this area, right? Um, the, the concentration of what happens in Kendall Square is a big magnet for them. But I will say that supportive capital and big time capital in order to scale up in the way that this described is a still uh, a working process. But the availability of a lot of capital is still much needed. And we don't have it as much as possible uh, to fulfill the ambition of the development. I see a lot of reverse trends right now with people are moving out of Silicon Valley. And this is, I love Silicon Valley. I spent many, many years there. But I think uh, Massachusetts has some incredible advantages. Our education system being number one in the country is super important to people. If you're on Silicon Valley, you're chasing private school education in a very serious way. I see a lot of people moving back with their young kids. They went two or three years, come back here with young kids. That's awesome, but we also need to keep people here. You know, right from getting that was part of the engine. It's like, hey, could we fund them and get them to stay here right now? But 
And we're not really competing on Facebook. We're competing, you know, consumer technology like that. There are a lot of advantages to being in Europe or Silicon Valley. You can do it here, but it's harder. We're talking about these other industries, which I think are even more important to our economy across education and health and energy and manufacturing and those we can really compete with almost anyone. I just wanted to add something from the previous question about the
integrate the alumni community to bring some of the resources we have other than just writing a check uh, into this process. And of course, some of us might even like to live in the area. And I'm wondering if you are considering picking up the proposal that was floated by Paul Gray and Bob Simpon about having uh, independent living for uh, older people as part of this redevelopment. I'll just say um, we have many alums of old generations involved in Older. Um, <laughs> older than 22, yes. Um, and people well into their 80s who, who have incredible expertise. Actually, the fusion company I was mentioning, some of the human beings who built the first Tokamax in the US are certainly above 60, I would say well into their 80s, um, but have this unbelievable knowledge about how to build these things that are coming to help. So I, I, I think it's kind of an ageless piece here, and uh, but I can't speak to any of the construction projects. I would just say the, uh, the broader concept of housing for the NRT community, I think in general, we know that we will create 1,400 units of housing uh, in Poultry, about 300 units in, in Kendall. At the end of the day, this is our community. I think um, you know we're totally integrated with uh, you know our faculty, stu our students, our staff, our local community here, the business community. I think we look at that as a broad community, and, and that housing will support them. And the extent that some of that can be available for people who want to gather and, and uh, like-mindedness and, and from alumni, I think that's Probably a possibility. All right, we have time for one or two more, please. All right, a, a quick question. I'm really interested in your thoughts about third spaces for art and music, philosophy, worship. What are the what what's your thinking about places that are not home and not work or people can come together in Kendall Square? I'll comment on that. I think um, you know we started some of this activity if you went back at Israel showed you some some photographs of you know, what Kendall Square looked like in the 40s, 50s, and actually even the 60s, something like this, uh, when Tech Square was being done. Uh, it was a pretty rough environment out here. Uh, you look at some of those photos, you still see oil tanks, uh, smokestacks. I still get people asking, you know, what a really risky old Kendall Square. Um, so some of that stuff, people, you know, some people did like. But I think, in general, we're trying to make the environment of a long journey a safe environment, a secure environment. We're working our way towards making sure that all the accessories are available. Again, things like the grocery store, the drugstore, amenities, a restaurant, a place to have breakfast. Uh, all of those are important. I think as we move the lunch struggle we have with the Kendall Square initiative, we ran out of space. People had ideas about museums and culture and art things, and we didn't have space to do it. We barely could get the grocery store in. In fact, the grocery store probably only has 1,000 square feet more. So our struggle was we ran out of footprint. And I think the good news is with both being on the horizon, it will take you know number of years, that gives us an opportunity to think more broadly about other types of uh, entertainment, arts, culture. And you know, we try to weave that within our uh, development and our enterprises. Um, there will certainly be arts in the buildings and in the open space that we're creating on the campus here. Uh, but that notion of trying to create an environment that is you know, continuing from safe, secure, to I can get a loaf of bread and milk, and I can also enjoy myself in Kendall Square. Culturally, I think it's important for us, and we've got to figure out exactly how to, how to execute that over time. Uh, Jack Wolf, Sloan Fellow, uh, 7071. So I remember American built right and what this Kendall Square was like back in the day. Question is on the human side. Last numbers I heard for uh, employment in Kendall Square in around 48,000 a few years a few years ago. I'm sure it's going to be 75 to 100,000 in 20 years. What kind of planning is being done to ensure that we have some distribution, socioeconomically, of jobs and availability for people of all ranks, not just postdocs, not just highly educated folks? So could you talk a little bit about the workforce you see here? and the employment that you see here in the future. I'll start, it's okay. I think, uh, you know, number one, I think we do expect the employment to grow. I think we expect the population to grow. 
I, uh, until people stop having babies, that will be inevitable. I think we, we are going to, you know, the planet's growing and this area is growing. I think urbanization is the result of that. Um, and it just so happens, I think, that urbanization today is due, uh, quite rightly, I think, very sustainable in, in the way of building a community here. It's also exciting to exchange that is in that community. I think, you know, I'll let Liz talk a little bit about maybe the nature of work and study it, but MIT takes that very seriously. I think um, we spent some time in our recent Volpe uh, rezoning um, talking to the neighborhood and community about some of those issues. We can't solve them all. I mean, they're huge. Um, but the notion of creating, one of the things we've been committed to is creating a community center in Volpe. And this is a swimming pool and gym, trying, trying to create a place that the neighborhood community can join the MIT community and the business community. And what an opportunity to spend some time in a place like that. We have the exposure to mentorship and, and, and inclusiveness and an opportunity to, you know, be able to interact with the meritocracy that's in Kendall Square. We committed to uh, a job connector, a place that we could uh, house, and, uh, a place that, uh, you know, we're worried about where are people who may be not uh, doing fusion uh, research or some other thing, but there are any jobs. And, and our jobs that have done the Kendall Square area. Um, how do we at least make people educated about that? So we made a commitment to a job center. We made a, a commitment to, uh, we were the first group that made a commitment to 20% affordable housing at, at our development on Broadway. Um, we went through and did more than that in Volpe. So we'll, in the end, have about 360 units of affordable housing. Here. So I, I don't know that that's going to move the needle dramatically, but it's a it's a signal that MIT is taking very seriously. It's a very material investment for us. It represents millions and millions of dollars. And I think it's a step in the right direction. And I think we're trying to figure that out again. We'll solve these problems as a community. And I think that's one that we all hold. So I think we're working our way in that direction. And I don't know if Liz wants to tell me about the name of the work. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> well, certainly the trends that we all experience right now that we see um, unless we have some significant changes at multiple levels, policy level, national level, regional level, um, we can expect them to continue, right? Both globalization and technology have accelerated the returns to higher skills, higher education, have decreased those returns for lower educated um, folks, and we've seen this increasing inequality for decades now. Um, and what we expect is that this technology, the new technology, technology coming into our will be the um, vast majority of it will be complementary to all of our skill sets. For some people, it will be um, will replace jobs. Um, and so we have to, as a society, figure out how we're going to address that. I think it's bigger than Kendall Square. I think there are steps being taken to try and integrate and have been for a long time. How do we get the benefits of this region to spread more broadly? And that takes active efforts that you know, Steve's talking about, but also um, if you think about hack diversity and all of the other steps that we're taking as a community. Um, but what I would say that broadly speaking, I hope we think about diversity broadly for this, for this area. That it's diversity in industry, it's diversity in stage of company growth, it's diversity between the services and the, and the professional uh, work, and it's diversity in terms of race and gender and all the other ways we think about it. But we have to be very actively thinking and kind of engaged in this um, to fight a trend that has been, um, that's one that is facing the country as a whole. And I think that this is going to be, this is why MIT took on this uh, question of work of the future. I think uh, President Rice sees it as one of the most important things MIT team can be doing right now. And so we hope to be engaging with everyone about this and about what we as a society should be doing to stop some of these trends. We have three minutes and one last question. Uh, thank you very much for a very informative, great presentation. I had a question about the apartment building along the Memorial Drive between the President's office, President's home, and uh, Sloan campus. Once the lease is over, what are the plans there? I can speak to that. Um, about the Drive. And we cannot make yeah. it. <laughs> So Hunter Road Drive uh, is a uh, part building that is on the ground lease that will come back to MIT in, I think, five or six years from now. That's just certain. But uh, at this point in time, MIT has no plans to uh, change uh, the site. So my guess is, is that we will certainly think about things over time in terms of what we're doing in Kendall Square broadly. Uh, frankly, we have our hands full with uh, everything we're doing in Kendall. 
I'm sure the institute will think about it, but any plans um, that we have to do anything on herbal drive will be uh, communicated well in advance of having any type of structure. So I think our sense is that we'll hopefully uh, the community will rest easy and enjoy it. You won't notice the difference of ownership between uh, uh, the Goldman Company today and MIT in the near future. When is the diesel? I think it's five years. Is it five years? Five years. Okay, so we are out of time, but I invite you to join us for coffee uh, in the foyer uh, right after this. Um, thank you for coming. Thank you for your, your very, very good questions, and I hope you will join me in thanking Mike, Whitney, and our panelists.